when Pam and I have been in this fellowship now just over a little over a year. And uh, one of the deciding factors that we wanted this to be our new spiritual home was the fact that Mike preaches the word of God very clearly, very concisely, along with Rudin, along with Dion as well. The word of God is valued in this place from Genesis to Revelation. And that's so, so important. And this now is our spiritual home. So we welcome you, Mike. Come and bless our hearts with what you've got to share with us. Thank you. Amen. If you want to uh, open your Bibles to anywhere this evening, if you'd like to turn with me to uh, Leviticus chapter 23, although we might take a little while getting there. <clears throat> I'm going to look this evening at uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, um, but as you may or may not be aware, there are officially sort of seven feasts in, which I mentioned in Leviticus 23. And I was asking the question as I was sort of pulling this together, and um, what is the aim of the feasts? I mean, why did God tell his people that they've got to have seven feasts? Has anybody ever thought of that question? Prophecy. Prophecy, fulfilling prophecy, looking to the future. But for the people at the time, it was to remind them on an annual basis, if nothing else, about what he'd done for them. And that's important for us as Christians as well, that we remember the things that God has done for us. It's very important that we do that. I know when my children were, they attended a Church of England school in Mortimer, and, you know, sort of, it almost seemed like about every three or four weeks they were traipsed off down the hill to Mortimer St. Mary's for another sort of Christian festival. Um, but actually, one of the things that we learned was that the, the person who was leading them at that time then told them what it meant with regard to the Christian faith and reminded them about what it is that they should be believing. And I always think this is for the Jewish people, is if nothing else... The feasts not only are looking to the future, but it's also reminding them of what God has done in the past. And that is very important. And so for us, let's, that I'm going to start with, this is one of my favorite passages at the moment, and that is from 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13 down as far as verse 18, where it says the following, it says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. In other words, those who went before lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. The world has no hope, but we do have a hope. But God does not want us to be an ignorant people. We need to be those who are informed that we can answer the questions that the people out there probably don't know they need to ask, but are asking increasingly. If you have a look on social media, or maybe don't look on social media, there are all sorts of people out there now who are saying, what on earth is going on? And we need to be a people who have answers to that. And we need to have answers to the Jewish people. So here we find, and I think, yes, we're on the right slide now. Here we find listed are the seven feasts of the Lord, which we find in the book of Leviticus. And I've got the Bible verses up there. And I must admit that this came about, um, sharing this came about about six, eight weeks ago. Somebody turned, rang me up and said, um, oh, we've got a meeting on Saturday night, will you speak? And I went, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Will you speak on the feasts of the Lord? This is Monday, by the way. And I must admit, I knew about that much about the feasts of the Lord that I got into. And I said, Lord, I'm going to need your help this week. I must admit, by the time I got to Saturday, I knew about this much, and I still don't know it all. But God just taught me so much as I started to look at the feasts of the Lord. And you see, there we have the feasts as they are named. You know, we've got Passover, unleavened bread, first fruit, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. And tabernacles is what we're going to look at in a little bit of detail tonight. But you see, what we then can do is we can then add the next layer. And the next layer actually says, from each one of those feasts, they speak of Jesus. 
And that's a very, very important thing for any of our Jewish brothers and sisters that we can turn around and say, look, these feasts which you celebrate speak of Jesus. For example, Passover speaks about Christ's death. We know all about that, and it links back to, doesn't it, the Passover in Egypt. We then have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, talks about Jesus' burial. First fruits, his resurrection. Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Trumpets talks about Christ's return, and aren't we looking forward to that? But as Jewish people, they are expecting Jesus to come for the first time. And it then talks about atonement, talks about restoration, a national restoration of the land. And as we see some of the things that are going on in the land of Israel, don't they need restoration? But also, apart from that, once the nation had been restored, we then see that Tabernacles talks about God dwelling with his people and their kingdom will be restored. So let's have a look at Jeremiah 31. We will come back to Exodus in a minute if you want to have a look there. <clears throat> but it says in Jeremiah 31 and verse 31, it says the following. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. If you remember, we looked at that in great detail, didn't we? Lessons in the life of Moses. <clears throat> we saw how God took that people in a miraculous way and brought them out of the land of Egypt. How he ever did it with a stubborn and rebellious people, I do not know, but he did. But it then says, and picking up in verse 33, it said, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their people, and they will be my God. Isn't that a good thing? You know, obviously, you're not getting very excited. You've had a long day. I got excited by that, because when I look at the nation of Israel, I think, Lord, how are you going to do it? But can I say one thing about it? God is prospering that nation. If you go out to buy a car today brand new car, unless it's sitting in a field in Thurrock in Essex with weeds growing up through it, and there are quite a few out there, they'll quote you 18 months for that car because there is a semiconductor shortage. Those are transistors and chips and all that sort of stuff. Where is there not a semiconductor shortage? In Israel, because they make their own. One of the biggest chip integrated circuits manufacturers in the world is currently Israel. And could I say they could, sh they could change the electronics issue overnight, but sitting in the background is that thing called boycott Israeli goods. Can I say when we put the AV kit together, I tried where I could to buy kit that originated in Israel, and I still do to today because I believe we should be blessing the nation. But it's God says, as it says here, they will be my, I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all, know me, I wanted to write the word all in a huge, because they will. From the least to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, and remember, I will remember no more. So God is going to forgive what the things they've done wrong, and also iniquity talks about worship of false gods. God says he's going to forgive that for the people. And Ezekiel 36 says the following. I hope, I've got excited as I prepare this. It says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. I will give you a new heart. God has given us a new heart. But he's going to give the Jewish people, those stubborn people. I grew up in the biggest Jewish community in Western Europe when I was a kid. Outside Golders Green. The London Borough of Redbridge. And can I say, in the junior school, there were eight of us who weren't Jewish. 
And when they had Jewish holidays, the eight of us was sat there in school and went, oh, this is good. There were more teachers than there were children. But I knew what it was like to be bullied by them because I wasn't Jewish. But you see, the question is, God is going to give them a new heart. And I knew they, they, were, they were hard working, but they were hard people. And it says, I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. That will be amazing, won't it? You know, they won't need police in Israel telling them what they can and can't do because everybody will know in their heart what they need to do. And Zechariah 13 says, in that day, this is the day of the Lord when God does these things, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for uncleanness. It shall be in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land. They shall no longer be remembered. That will be a great day, won't it? Think about how many modern idols there are in the land of Israel. Where is one of the biggest... I've got to be careful. Word begins with P you know, marches in the world currently. Tel Aviv. People go from all over the world to take part in that event. But God says, it won't happen anymore. I will take their uncleanness away from them. It shall be in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols. They shall no longer be remembered, and I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirits to depart from the land. Isn't that exciting? And I've only done the intro. But you see, one of the things for us as concerned is that we add another layer. And we couldn't be there without, if you like, the Christian layer. I've, I've put that in, but we're not focusing on that this evening. You see, where it says the Passover, what happened at the Passover, we get, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Christ became our unleavened bread for us. He has risen from the dead. And as we heard this evening, you know, the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost. And we can still experience that filling with the Holy Spirit. But you see, that's important for us to remember. And this is what the feasts will be like when it comes to it. So let's just have a quick look. Yes. And here is, and you may ask, well, where do the feasts fit? Well, I'll be honest with you, yes, I spent a long time not drawing this. <laughs> I pinched it. However, I just thought I'd mention it shows us where the feasts fit in, if you like, to the Roman calendar. Okay, I'm, I'll, post, I'll put this PowerPoint up on uh, Yammer later on. But you see... Well, the important thing is that each one of those feasts actually points to Jesus. And that's the important thing for the children of Israel to consider and for us to consider. But you see, it's absolutely vital that we understand. And if you look, we're looking, yes, okay, so we're in November. We're a little bit late for tabernacles. But it doesn't matter when. But it's an important fact of what we do. So we've got Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and then a gap. Pentecost, and then another gap. And then you've got trumpets, Day of Atonement, and tabernacles, which is what we are going to look at tonight. And you see, yeah, that's an extra... I haven't got that slide, so I'm going to have to cheat. And it says, um, one, there are, this is the tabernacles is one of the three compulsory feasts which any good male Jew had to attend if they were living in the land of Israel. They had to go to Passover. They had to go to Pentecost... And then they had to go to tabernacles. If they could make it to the beginning, great, but tabernacles was the important one. And there are a couple of terms there that I just wanted to refer to because I thought I got this really excited when I started to find it. And there's the word sukkah, which is what they build. They build this hut, if you like. And um, when I finished, I've got a little video I found about what were all the little tabernacles in Israel that were made this year. But you see, if you look at that word, the Greek equivalent is called 
skino, which talks about pitching a tent. And if you start to dig down, as you know I like to do, you actually find that only appears, appears once in the New Testament. Okay, and it's in John chapter 1 and verse 14, right at the beginning of the Gospel of John. It says, the word became flesh and sukino among us, dwelt among us. In exactly the same way as God wants to dwell with his people, John was saying that Jesus is here and God can dwell with us today. Similar words. And I just put down there that it says we have a, on day one, we find that they started with a burnt offering to make sure all atonement for sin was dealt with. And then it finishes with a burnt offering. And one of the things about tabernacles is all about a celebration, and it's a celebration of a successful harvest. And Helen and I were talking about this over dinner today, and we were saying, what have we forgotten to do in this country? What don't we do anymore? Harvest yes, yes, Harvest Festival had become a very pagan thing. But I think as a church, we have thrown out the baby with the bathwater. I remember a few years ago, I used to regularly go and preach at a tiny little church over in Binfield Heath, a sonning way, and they used to have harvest, and they always used to invite me in for harvest. And can I say, for a congregation of six, sometimes when we went as a family, we doubled the size of the congregation. That was Helen and I and the two boys. Boy, could they put on a harvest display of thanking God for what had been produced. And I think we... And we have actually forgotten to thank God for a successful harvest. You see, the tabernacles was also about, if you've ever seen the booths, what do they put on? What do they put around the booths? We'll see it on the video a little bit later on. They hang fruit. They hang particularly wheat, and they hang grapes, because that is the end of the wheat and the grape harvest. And I think we as Christians have forgotten to say thank you. I was sharing before the meeting. <clears throat> you see, the world has forgotten to say thank you too. Um, and I, Helen, sometimes I drive her up the wall with some of the things I watch on YouTube, but I quite like the technology of farming. And I've been following some Christian farmers in America. And something we need to pray about, and that is there's a Christian family in Montana who grow wheat. And normally they would expect their combine harvesters to be bringing in 80 to 100 bushels per acre. Now I know that's American units. A bushel is about a gallon, you know. So they're expecting to bring in about 80 to 100 bushels per acre. This year they've bringing in, been bringing in between six and nine. This is the breadbasket of America. And these are Christians, and they say they're doing well. And when your combine harvester consumes 300 gallons of diesel a day, they're saying it's hardly worth putting the combines in the field. And the interesting thing is that, you know, we, we need to be those who say thankful. We need to be thankful. But we need to be aware that God is starting to move in a way. And they say, well, what's been different? They've watered it the same way. They've done exactly the same things as they've always done. There just isn't the grain on the wheat. <clears throat> and they are saying, well, there was a little conclusion. And somebody said, well, maybe you need to be a bit more thankful. And it's interesting that if you look in the comments, they are commenting about that. But you see, Jesus wants us to be a grateful people. And that's what it was all about. So let's have a quick look at Leviticus 23. I said put your finger in Leviticus 23, and we will come there. And this is the chapter, this is the chunk. We're now into tabernacles, and I've talked about this as tabernacles past. Because it says, the Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites on the 15th day of the seventh month, the Lord's festival of tabernacles begins, and it lasts for seven days. 
And the first day is a sacred assembly and do no regular work. For seven days present food offerings to the Lord. And on the eighth day hold a sacred assembly and hold food offering to the Lord. It is a special closing assembly, do no regular work. And these are God's appointed festivals which you are to proclaim as a sacred assembly for bringing the food offerings to the Lord. Burnt offerings and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings are required for each day. And these offerings are in addition to those for the Lord's Sabbaths. In addition to your gifts and whatever you have vowed on the free will offerings that you will give to the Lord. God wanted his people to, to yes, bring offerings to him, but to celebrate the goodness of that which he has provided them with. And this was to remind them on, a, <coughs> on an annual basis of them when they lived in the tents in the wilderness. And what did they eat all that time for 40 years in the wilderness? Manna. They saw God's provision. And the tabernacles is all about remembering God's provision. We need to be those who remember God's provision. The fact that God dwells with us and wants to be with us in all the things that we are doing. And as we continue to read on in Leviticus 23, there are bits and pieces I pick up here. So it says, So the beginning with the 15th day of the seventh month, after you have gathered the crops of the land. Look, this is when it's going to take place. Celebrate the festival of the Lord for seven days. On the first day is a day of Sabbath rest. Well, I'll be honest with you, if you've been harvesting, you're going to need a rest. There are... I've been one of the, one of the YouTube channels I've been watching. They have been harvesting 22 hours a day to try and get the crops in this year. And why do they not harvest for the last two, day, two hours of the day? Because somebody is maintaining the combine harvester. It takes two hours to refuel and whatever, and they're off again. And if you've been harvesting that hard, as they say, they were, there was a question was asked, but you're Christians, what happens to church on Sunday? And they said, during harvest, God understands. For three weeks, God understands. And then one of, them, one of the, the guys says, you know, we've been there for the rest of the weeks. When you're sat in a combine harvester, you can pray praise music and you can praise God for every bit of grain that goes through the front. But you see, God wanted them to have a Sabbath rest. And it says, on the first day you are to take branches from luxuriant trees, from palms and willows and other leafy trees, and rejoice before the Lord for seven days. Celebrate this as a festival of the Lord's for seven days each year. This is to be a lasting ordinance. This is not something for a one-off. This is to be remembered because it's important that the children of Israel and for us, we remember the things that God has done. And it says, for the generations to come, celebrated in the seventh month, we saw the calendar. It says, live in temporary shelters for seven days. All native-born Isra Isra Israelites are to live in such shelters, so your descendants will know that the Israelites live in temporary shelters when I brought them out of Egypt, for I am the Lord your God. If you remember, when they were camped, you know, when the cloud lifted, what did they have to do? Pack up and move on. You know, I keep, keep saying to Helen, we're going to have to refine, we are planning a little trip, and I said to her, we're going to have to refine how we work our caravan. We can't be taking two hours to set up and two hours to set down. <clears throat> but you imagine every day you'd look up and go, right, the cloud's there, Shoot, that's all right, we can stay here. You know, you've got to pack it all up, pack all your animals up and move on. Six million people. But you see, God wanted them to remember that in all of that, he was their provider. And let's look in Zechariah chapter 8. So that was the past. God wanted to remind the children of Israel of the past. <clears throat> and let's look at the present. And it says in Zechariah 8 and 20 down to 23, it says the following. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts, peoples shall yet come inhabitants of many cities inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying let us continue to go and pray before the Lord <coughs> and seek the Lord of hosts and I myself will also go yes many peoples and strong nations shall come and seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and also pray before the Lord that happens every year around tabernacles 
The International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem organizes a major event, and I will just show you, hopefully, at the end, a couple of little short videos where you can see what's been going on to celebrate tabernacles this year in Jerusalem. And thus the Lord of hosts says, In those days... <coughs> Ten men from every language and nation shall grasp the sleeve of the Jewish man, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. That will be when God, you know, the, won't it be amazing when the Jews go up and that we want to, need to go with them? That's quite incredible. And that's the present. It happens today. So what about the future? Well, let's have a look at Zechariah 14. And it says the following, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall be, the Lord is one is his name. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, that's implying that those who did, God judged, those who were left, shall go up from year to year to worship the king and the Lord of hosts and to keep the feast of tabernacles. This is something that is going to be celebrated and celebrated and celebrated. And it shall be that whatever the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. That's an interesting judgment, isn't it? There will come a time that if you don't go to Jerusalem to worship God, God will not bless your land. <clears throat> And Isaiah 11 says the following, and it says, They shall not hurt or destroy in my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That is going to happen. God is going to reveal himself, and he's doing so to people. And Habakkuk 2 says, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters covered the sea the sea. That is going to be an amazing time when that happens. Note these two passages. Note there is an additional word in the second one. The first one says, full of the knowledge of the Lord. In the second case in Habakkuk, he says, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Isn't that going to be fabulous? But you see, that's important that we remember the word, the tabernacles is for celebrating what God has done. It comes to the end of that remembrance and the Jewish people will celebrate that. And just finally, just to remind us, and the bottom three I've put in there is really for us. As Christians, we should be looking forward to these. <clears throat> and that is that the festivals represent to us the rapture of the church. I'm not going to go into where that's going to happen. <clears throat> the redemption of God's people and the restoration of God's kingdom. And for us, as we share, maybe share this with other people, you see, Tabernacles is all about that thing that went on, that final move of God when he was with those people for 40 years in the wilderness. But you see, one of the important things is when we look at it prophetically, the first four have happened. We go, yep, 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 yep. So if the first four happened literally, the last three are going to happen literally. And that's important for us as God's people to remember. And just that we will know God's dwelling with his people, and I've got a note here somewhere, you know when you put a star and a bit of paper, and I can't find the bit of paper, but never mind. But it's important for us, if you like, that when we look at the Jewish people, A, we pray that God will demonstrate himself to them, but also we that ourselves will be rapture ready for what's going to happen. And I've just finished with some pictures, and I took these. These are from the Feast of Tabernacles this year in Jerusalem. And what I'm going to do now, if that's okay, I've got two little videos, Snoop, one of which is a little guided tour, it's about minute and a half of all the different tabernacles that are in Jerusalem today, this year. And lastly is a little snippet from, and I won't show you too much of it, from the parade of the nations in Jerusalem. Because 
I did find a video where they are presenting everybody, you know, the United Kingdom, the USA, all bringing their flags forward. Uh, that is two and a quarter hours, and they didn't think we really wanted to watch them bringing the flags, and everybody applauds. But hopefully I've got a couple of little video snippets that I'm going to show, unless Dave's found, I'm, he's going to, so, I'll just, we'll just, I think that's more or less what we're going to end up with, isn't it, with the last two. So hopefully that's helped you, and I'm just going to show you these two little video clips.